continuing on our theme for this month, which we've entitled, God is working in you and through you. We're drawing lessons from our Word Explosion Conference, wherein we used Philippians 2, 12 and 13 as our main text. And we noted a number of things from those two verses. Number one, that uh, we need to work out our salvation. We did explain in detail that the Bible in that verse doesn't say we must work for salvation, uh, but to work out our salvation. And our understanding is that now that we have received Christ as Savior and Lord of our lives, we need to start putting into practice certain principles that are in line with what God has purposed for our lives. You see, every one of us, we are here on earth by God's purpose. You are not a mistake. Can I hear a good amen? amen. We are here to fulfill purpose. All of us here, we are men and women on assignment. Living here on borrowed time. You remember the theme verse in our, in our word explosion was working whilst it is still day. So we're saying, we're challenging ourselves and we want to see how does that look like? How do I practically work whilst it is still there? How do I get involved in what God has purposed in my life? So that verse says we must work out, but then it says our own salvation. In other words, busy yourself with what concerns you. Right? Don't look at your neighbor and say they're not doing such and such. But look at how far you are involved in what God has purposed for your life. And the only thing we should compare ourselves with in the words of Paul, Paul says, I want to apprehend that for which Christ has apprehended for me. What he's saying, in essence, is that if I was to stand next to Christ, who is a picture of how far I must go and what I must do with my life, as I stand next to that picture, I compare myself as how far I have come. And, and he says, you know, I realize I want to do everything that God has called me to do. I'm paraphrasing. I want to do everything that God has assigned me to do, fulfill my purpose, live out the full purpose for my life. But then it says then when we work out that salvation, we must do so with fear and trembling. This is not the fear that paralyzes us into inactivity, but it's a fear of self-distrust. But it's a fear as well of a realization that one day each one of us is going to stand before God and give an account for their lives. Now, I'm not talking about heaven and hell here, because if you're already born again, you are going to heaven. If you live the life and you live for God, you are going to heaven. But we do know there's going to come a time where we're going to receive rewards. And the Bible says we will receive rewards in accordance with all those things that we did whilst in our body. So each one of us is going to stand before God and give an account for your assignment. All of us here. And it is on that basis that we will receive rewards and we will receive crowns in heaven. So it says, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But then we love the next part. It says, it is God who is working in you. In other words, God is at work. He's the one who's energizing us. He's the one who is, is inspiring us. He is the one who gives you a sense of feeling discontented if you are not doing what you should be doing with your life. And so today, what we want to answer and I'm not sure how far we will go, we'll see how far to go, is where do I fit in God's plan in my life? In other words, how do I find my fit? How do I know what I'm called for or what God has purposed for my life? How do I know that? Where do I fit in the greater scheme of God's plan? Now, in our past lessons, we've talked about identifying our shape and we're using the word shape as an acronym. Now, all of these... Uh, I see our teachers here who are doing uh, Leadership 101 are smiling because this is what we learn in our lessons, uh, Leadership 101. Each one of us must be able to identify our shape. Somebody tell your neighbor, you need to identify your shape. Or, or put it this way, you need to know your shape. Now, we're using those words shape, S, full stop, H, full stop, A, full stop, P, full stop, and E, full stop, as an acronym to explain how each of us is created and gifted uniquely by God to fulfill God's purpose in this world. In other words, whilst we are breathing, God has designed us to be able to fulfill his purpose. And for that reason, 
God has given each of us a shape. All right? Now, this is a refresher course. We're just going through it quickly. We're not going to spend too much time for it. We said the letter S stands for spiritual gift. All right? So every one of us here, we have at least one spiritual gift. Usually, it's more than that. Okay? But you have at least one. In this world of unfairness and in this world where there's a lot of inequality, there's one area where we are all equal. Everybody has a spiritual gift that comes from God. Usually, it is more than one gift. And when you read the Bible, you'll find there's about 32 to 36 spiritual gifts in total. When you read Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, Exodus 35, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's around 36, 32, 36 gifts that we find, right? And these gifts uh, cover many areas, and I'll talk about that later on. But every one of us has been given a gift by God. And we said spiritual gift indicate to us what we will do with our life. In other words, now that you're on this earth, what do you do with your life? What do you give your life to? And it's always important for us to give our lives in line with what God has shaped us. So all of us have got spiritual gifts, all right? And then the letter A stands for heart or passion. Or like you young people say, passion. So when we speak of our heart or our passion, as young people say, what it means is that there are things that are closer to your heart than others. There are things that you care about. Things that if they are out of order, it concerns you. Things that when you see them not being where they should be, you want to jump in and do something about it. And all of us, we care about different things, but that caring, that heart, that passion, it's something that is divine. It's something that has been planted on the inside of you by God himself. We noted in Exodus chapter 3 how Moses was so concerned about the condition of his people in Egypt that without invitation, he jumped in to try and solve a problem. And that was his heart talking. His heart kind of overrode his thinking that he jumped in and ended up killing somebody. Now, we're not saying killing is right, but you see, when you care so deeply about something, you don't need an invitation. All right, and sometimes maybe your plan might not be the best. You know, maybe how you execute what you execute might not be the best. And when God spoke to him, he actually made a reference to that passion that Moses had in his heart. God says, I have seen I have seen the pain of my people, and I've heard their cry. For that reason, I am calling you. Why is God calling him? Because Moses feels the same pain that God is feeling. Moses is concerned about the people in the same way God is concerned about. So there are some of you here, you know, God has given you a heart or a passion for leadership. So sometimes you are in an organization where there's very poor leadership, and it bothers you. And it troubles you. And you know what you find? You'll realize that in your area of passion, you seem to be more sensitized. You seem to see what other people don't see. Because that's how you are wired. You have passion. Tell your neighbor you have passion, neighbor. Even if you're not saying amen, you have passion. All right? The letter A stands for ability. We're just reminding ourselves. And we said ability is in two ways. A, it's God-given ability, what we call a talent. Or as we find in Exodus 35, verse 30, we read about Heal, whom God has anointed or God has given the ability to be a craftsman. And may I, may I submit to you that these gifts, as much as we talk, we call them spiritual gifts, these are gifts that God has given to all, not exclusively to born-again people, all right? But to all people, you look around the world, there are people who have what we call natural talent. There are people who are just great singers, you know? When they stand and sing, you get blessed, and you find they don't know anything about music, they can't read a score, they've never been to a music school, but the way they sing, even if you've been to a music school, you don't come anywhere close to those people. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Now, when you stand, you try to sing, it becomes a big discussion right there, because instead of music, it's just talking. But they get up, and, and you see even children at a young age, I mean, there are kids who at a very young age, I saw uh, on YouTube yesterday, uh, no, no, the other day, I saw there's this young, this boy, I think he's probably 
six years old, seven years old, he can play a piano. He can't read a score. He's not been to music, uh, to a music school. But he can play a piano. I mean, the way he plays, six years old. You know, it's just a talent. I don't know how many of you know about uh, Andrew Crouch. Many of you know about Andrew Crouch. And uh, most people don't know that Andrew Crouch could not read music. He composed so many songs that some of his songs are so good that entire orchestras would play a song that he composed. But he couldn't read music. You know what happened? When his father, who was a pastor of a Baptist church, got to a point in the church where he didn't have a pianist. You know, he looked for a pianist for many years, didn't have a pianist. And you know how the Baptists preach, eh? They preach and sing, or they sing their sermon, you know. You know what I mean? Can I get an amen? Mm. So they do some of that. So you've got to have a pianist, you know. Can I have a witness? Mm. Maybe I'll do that too, you know. Mm. So, yeah. So he needed a pianist, but, you know, they couldn't find one. So he talked to Andrew Crouch, who I believe at the time, he was 11 years old or 14 years old. And, and he said to him, would you help me? Can I pray for you that God will give you the ability to play a piano? Now, Andrew Crouch at the time had a very bad stammer. He was stuttering quite a lot. He, he, he was stammering, couldn't play any music. His dad prayed for him. And, and, and Andrew Crouch went to the piano and started playing. You know, he couldn't read music, couldn't write a score. But if you listen to his composition, unbelievable. And two things happened. He got the ability to play the piano, and the, the stammering stopped immediately. Yeah, yeah, God gives people gifts. In this place, there are many people Many people who are gifted like that, you've got a talent that comes from God. You look at people who are gifted as strikers in soccer. You know, you can see the way they, are, they, are, the way they play, not just when they are on the ball, when they're off the ball. They think like a striker, you know, and, and you find sometimes they've not even been trained as yet. And this is why I want to encourage you young people. Go to school and train in line with your gift and your talent. All right, because when you have talent which is a God-given or natural ability, whatever you want to call it. And then you go to school and train in line with that. Oh, you become a dangerous person. Many of you, you know Kirk Franklin. His music is so great. I mean, incredible. But have you ever heard Kirk Franklin singing? Please pray that you don't hear him singing. Because the brother can't sing at all. That's why he's, he talks his music. You know, he talks his music. But my goodness, his composition. He's got an ear for music. He can compose. He's got just incredible music. And that person sitting next to you, there's an area where they are that good. Yeah, they may not know it yet. Because many people are not exploring their shape. They, they are not, you know, doing things in line with the way they're gifted. But also abilities, B, is acquired ability, acquiring skill. At least that's this 1010. You know, this is where we go for training and you hone your skills. And I, and I, but what I found interesting, and this is important, Bayesu, is that please understand, you know, skill is very important, but my argument is that try to get skill in line with your giftings. Because there's people who've been to music school, they studied everything, but when they stand and sing, you wonder, Mara, did you pay all that money for this? I mean, really, look at your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. I mean, did you pay all that money for this? Really? You know? You know, so just try to go in line with your area of gifting. And then the letter P stands for personal style. Everybody has a unique trademark. I like 1 Corinthians 12, 6. It says God works in different ways in us, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. So everybody here has got their trademark. That is just the way God has wired you. You know, there's just a certain uniqueness that you have. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm so glad you don't look like me and you don't sound like me and you're not like me. <laughs> but everybody has got their trademark. Amazing when you read the Bible, you can read about prophets. And you note all the prophets had their own trademark. I mean, Isaiah and, and wasn't, wasn't the same as, as, as Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was, the, was called the weeping prophet. Paul was not the same as Peter. So, so never try to be somebody else. God has made you to be a unique person to be you. But just discover, find out those unique abilities. And then the letter E is experiences. Experiences are an indicator where God wants to use you. Why is it so important? Because when you serve, know this, this is important. When you serve in line with your experiences, 
you get emotionally connected to what you're doing. You know, there's nothing as sad as people who serve in something, but they are so disconnected to it and they don't care. You know, and they don't care. They're doing it just to be doing it. And I was giving an example this morning, and this one is not a, it's not a bad example. It's a good example if you are a dentist. Please don't. I'm just using that as an example. Have you ever been to a dentist? And, and, and you see the, 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 the heartless, non-caring way in which they inject that long needle into your gums? Anybody knows when, you know, when, when they're holding this thing in their head, you there, you are almost about to faint. Amen? I mean, you are, trying to, you are trying to talk your way out of it. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? But they don't mind. They're just doing their thing and they're asking, how are you? You don't even know how you are, you know, you know. And they come and they inject that thing and they say, open your mouth, ah, and they inject that thing. And you can see this person has been injecting so many people that it's like they don't realize that I am human. And that's just going to inject me in a mechanical way. It's like a machine. You know what I mean? Now, why is it that God oftentimes will use you in line with your experiences? Let's go back to Moses. Moses growing up in a foreign land, never connecting with anybody, never been able to call the people he was with his own, raised like that, has to run away after he's killed somebody, goes to Midian. He realized what unfairness does. He realizes what oppression can do. He realizes how bad this system is. And so God goes to him and he says, look, you've been through this. I'm calling you. So even our bad experiences, God uses them to mold us and shape us. He may not be the cause of the bad experience, but through the bad experience, God can work something in our lives. You may have been one of those children who was uh, disowned by your parents. You know, kids who are picked up in the streets and they grow up in a, in a home of abandoned children, you see. And now here you are, you are an adult now, and there's something inside that keeps talking to you about serving in a home of abandoned children or maybe starting something like that. Why is it that you're the right person? Because you can connect with those children. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, Bahesu? You know how it feels like to, to, to not have a mom, to not have a dad, you know, whom you, whom you, they are your biological parent. And so God wants to use you in line with the shape. So the Bible makes it very clear that God has fashioned us the way we are with a purpose in mind. In other words, you know, Ephesians chapter 2, if you don't mind going there with me, let's look at it for a while. And I want to read it in two different translations. In the NIV Bible, it reads as follows. For we are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we are God's workmanship. So in other words, and I, I want to use the example that Dr. Marsman would like to use. It talks about manufacturing. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we were manufactured, but for a while, just allow me to use that as an example. When a, when a manufacturer manufactures something, it's because the, the product they're manufacturing is supposed to solve a certain problem. So in other words, the product does not precede the problem. The problem precedes the product. Uh, they're not saying amen here, so I'm coming, I'll come this side. I'll say, let me try you this side. So, so when you are a manufacturer, when you are a designer, when you are someone who, is, who creates or, or who forms things, whatever you are creating, manufacturing, forming, designing, it's an answer or it's a solution to a problem. For that reason, when you design whatever you design, you put inside of it everything needed, right, to solve the problem. It's not, it's not the design that comes first, it's the problem that comes first. Now, now that verse says, you and I, we are what? We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Oh, I can't hear you, class. To do what? To do what? To do what? To do what? 
You know why it says good works? Because it's good works because it's what God wants you to do, but it's good works because you're not going to fail at it. You're going to succeed at it. That's why it's called good works. Look to do good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So even before your mom got expectant of you, even before your dad met your mom, there was already a problem that exists in the world that God wanted that problem to be solved. So he moved on your mom and he moved on your dad that day when they were feeling romantic to do things that we will not talk about in church. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? And then you were conceived. But as you were conceived, as David says, God saw you being formed in your mother's womb. And he knitted you together, shaped you and formed you, gave you the gifts and the talents and the ability and the traits and the personality once you were still in your mother's womb. Because God knows there's a problem that needs to be solved. And I'm making somebody here who's going to solve that problem. Yeah, so you, when you were born, you were not born to look for an assignment. You were born to start something that was ordained for you even before you were born. Yeah. Unfortunately, not many people connect with what they were ordained for. So we come into the world, we do other things that were never our assignment in the first place. So what happens? We feel discontented unhappy, frustrated, right? And we're always dissatisfied. And there's no passion in what we're doing. We just do it to finish. So if you're working a job, if you knock off at four o'clock, supposed to knock off at four o'clock, by quarter to four, you've already packed your bags. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, Bishop saw you, what you're doing the other day. Uh-huh. So quarter to four, four o'clock, you're already at the gate, you're leaving. But when, when you're doing something that you're called for like Moses, you don't wait for an invitation. When Moses saw a problem, he jumped in to do something about it without an invitation, without a salary, without any pay. He didn't have to negotiate with anybody. He's there because there's something that's pushing him on the inside. I say the Holy Ghost is pushing you on the inside. Yeah. So when God talked to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 1, verse 5, he says, Before I formed you. <laughs> Before I formed you. In the womb, I knew you. In the Amplified, it says, I knew you and I approved you as my chosen instrument. Evazalana, you have already been approved by God. You have passed the test already, the quality control test. God has marked and said, This one is suited for that one. Oh, before I formed you, he says, I knew you and I proved you as my chosen instrument. And note, and before you were born, I separated you. I set you apart, consecrating you. To consecrate is to set apart for a special purpose. In other words, you know, if, if, if it's, you know, like, uh, I don't know how many of you, you know, if you use uh, uh, the ratchet set, you know, I like to use the, 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 the spanner called the uh, yeah, ratchet set. You know, it's got different sizes, number 10, number 15. But there are some of the sizes that are very rare. Yeah. And if you have that size, please don't lose it. Because that size, actually I was told by another mechanic the other day that there's a certain size. I've got a ratchet set. And he showed me, he said, you see this? particular one is meant for a specific part on all cars. And he said, all cars need this spanner. Yeah, he said, he said, he said, he said he, listen what he said, he says, this one, don't lose it. Guard it with your life because all cars. And he said, oh, Richard said, I bought it uh, in 1902. <laughs> no, 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 it's 1990 something. But you see, that spanner is set apart for a special purpose. If you take it and use it for something else, you won't see value in it. But there are certain parts. He was telling me, he said, this particular part in cars, you can only access it with the spanner. He says, there's no other spanner. He says, this, he says, this one, we use it in the workshop. And I said, look, I'm going to watch you that you don't take this when you leave here. Because <laughs> even if I'm not a mechanic, but it's, this one is separated. 
It's set apart. Yeah, and when everybody else fails, this one is going to work. I'm here telling somebody when everybody else fails. Oh, come on. If you know that you're separated, give the Lord a shout in the house. Oh! No wonder why there are people who succeed where others fail. They inherit a dead company that's losing a lot of money. In a short space of time, they're able to turn it around. Oh, yeah. You get to a school where the kids are failing, the, the teachers are demotivated, and everything is just haywire, and, and you get there. And just in a few months, there's a different spirit that's in the school. Just a different attitude. You know why? Because you were separated. You were set apart for that assignment. I hope you find out what God has set you apart for. Many people go through life never knowing what they were set apart for. Busying themselves with other people's assignments. And that's why you don't fit. Because you were never meant for that. Yeah, that's why you're not content. You're not happy. And, 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 and God never, ever, ever, there's no in the Bible where God said we must, we must necessarily try to work for a living. He said we must sustain ourselves. Mama, oh, oh. We should work. The Bible instructs us to work. But listen, listen. Rightfully, we should work in line with our gifting. Yeah. Because, because when you work in line with your gifting, you become contented. Imagine you feel contented and then they pay you on top of that. Is it, how would you like to feel like that every day? Eh? Than driving to work to do something you don't like. That you don't enjoy. That you are not gifted in. Hmm? You're just there because you're trying to pay the bills. Oh, how can you live like that? Look at anybody say, that's not the way to live. That's not the way to live. Before I formed you, I knew you. As a chosen vessel. Before you were born, I separated you. I set you apart, consecrated you. Note. He says, I appointed you as a prophet. Watch this. As a prophet to the nations. So there was already this thing. God needed a prophet to go to the nations. That, that's what needed to be sorted. And then God goes back and starts forming this guy. And I'm here to tell you, God did the same with you. But the question is, do you know what it is? So, in this series, we're going to try and unpack that. Let me, let me summarize. We are therefore conceived by God's foreknowledge. See, God knew about you. You're not a mistake. Maybe your parents said, whoop. <laughs> Birth control didn't work. <laughs> it doesn't matter what circumstances surrounded your conception. God knew about you. I said, God knew about you. I said, God knew about you. Even if they threw you away, God knew about you. So you are conceived by God's foreknowledge. Watch. Shaved and crafted in your mother's womb for your God-given assignment. I mean, when God shaped you and crafted you, put you together. It's for an assignment. God, he's the manufacturer. He's creating a product. That's going to solve a problem over. Sorry, I'm not calling you a product. I'm just saying that to try and explain, you know. You were born not to find an assignment, but to start what God has assigned you. Therefore, everyone has a shape. Now, let me give you a few examples of finding your fit in God's plan. Okay, many people struggle with knowing their gifts, their talents, or what they are shaped for. So I want us to examine some practical examples from the Bible to answer this question. And please, as I said, I'm not going to finish today, so we'll pick it up next week, okay? Let me give you the verses, and please don't read them now. Read them at home as an assignment, okay? But it's not all the verses, but just a few, all right? When you read Romans 12, you can write it down, verse 4 to verse 8. First Corinthians 12, verse 1 to 11. 1 Peter 4, verse 9 to 11, and 
Exodus 35 from verse 30 to Exodus 36 verse 2. And go over that again. Romans 12, 4 to 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, 1 Peter 4, 9 to 11, and Exodus 35 verse 30 to Exodus 36 verse 2. The Bible tells us explicitly, right, that each one of us has a gift or gifts that God has imparted in us. Okay? So let me mention just a few, and I've intentionally stayed away from what we find in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. You know, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, I've stayed away from that on purpose because, you know, oftentimes people think, okay, I'm not a pastor, I'm not called of God, you know, I'm not a prophet, I'm, I'm, I'm not called of God. But I want to show you in the scriptures, in the Bible, that even if you might not be a pastor, that gift that you have comes from God, and it has come by the Spirit of God just as much. Amen. Now, maybe when you are exercising that gift, nobody may say amen. amen. All right? Maybe there may not be any music or anything, but even if there's nothing spectacular that surrounds the gift, it's still a gift that comes from God anyhow. Amen. Are you understanding that? That's very important. So, let me just name a few. There are many of them. I've just chosen a few. And even with that, I'm not going to cover all, all of those gifts. There's a gift of administration, craftsmanship, creative communication, encouragement, hospitality, <laughs> leadership, <laughs> Mercy, teaching. I'm just giving you a few examples, all right? So we have administration, craftsmanship, creative communication, encouragement, hospitality, leadership, mercy, teaching. Now, so we'll do just a brief study on some of those gifts, okay? And maybe I'll start uh, right away. Now, the question is, how does God want to use me? And where does God want to use me. So let's talk about this gift of administration, right? Please allow me. I hope the, 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 the device is working well because I see we are struggling with our, our screens today. But let me give you the scriptures to, to write down. First Corinthians 12, verse 28, which I'd like to have on the screen, please, in the King James Bible. And then you can write down Acts chapter 6, 1 to 7, and I'll read Exodus chapter 18. I don't know if, yeah, okay, now. Here we go. Now, note, I'd like you to note the wording, right? It's so important, the wording in this text. Okay, are you ready, class? Yes. Can we read together? Yes. Okay, let's read. One, two, three. Yes. And God had set some in the church. Yeah? Yes. 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 Let's keep it there. Please keep the verse there. Now, note the opening statement. And God has set. So it is God who sets. Right? So it's, it's, if you have any of those gifts, right, it comes from God, right? It's not because you prayed harder than other people. Okay? It, it's not a sign of being more spiritual. Okay? And therefore, we don't need to be proud about it. And if you understand that it is God who has set, then it suggests that we should become good stewards of the gift. All right? So you see that, and I'll, I'll skip the apostles and all of that, but then I want us to go to, uh, uh, it says, then gifts of healing helps governments and diversities of tongues. Now that word governments, let's go to uh, the Amplified Bible, please. Note that word government. Can we have the Amplified Bible, please? We are going to read that. The reason I want it on the screen is that I want us to read it together. Can, do they have the Amplified Bible in the back? No, that's not the Amplified Bible. It's that lady over there. <laughs> we don't have the Amplified Bible. Then maybe then I... 
I had brought in something to read. Can I have my, my phone? Are they, are they able to have it in the Amplified Bible at the back? But why, 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 why? I sent it to them earlier. There. Okay, just ask them to be faster. Ne? Okay, let's read together. Uh, yeah, verse. Okay, let's read. One, two, three. So God has appointed for his own use. All right? So look at your neighbor and say, you've been appointed for God's own use. Look at the other neighbor and say, neighbor, you've been appointed for God's own use. Okay, here we go. It says, and God has appointed some in the church for his own use. First apostles, second prophets, uh, third teachers, then wonder workers. Go to the next verse because that's, I don't want to focus on that. With the ability to heal, help us and watch what it says, what? Say it again. Uh, so, so there's a gift of administration. Now, now you can go and study and, and get a qualification to, in public admin, right? But there's a, there's a spiritual gift of administrators. That word, governments, uh, is that word administrators. And what it means literally, from the original language, it means to steer. It speaks of like a pilot, pilotage, right? Figuratively, it talks about directorship or administration, even church administration. So when people administrate, it means they are there to pilot and to steer a ship. So let's describe this gift of government or administration. And some of you, you are wired that way, right? When you, when you get into anything, you have this administrative mind. You know, it's these people when you go on holiday with them, right? Six months before, no, one year ahead, they already know what they're going to be wearing on Monday and Tuesday, the list is already there. How many of you know people like that? They frustrate me. No, and I'm sorry, but I'm, 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 they already know where they must go. A year ahead. A year ahead. They, everything is planned out. You know, and, uh, and, and, and even on Monday, not only am I going to wear yellow, I'm going to visit such and such a place. And I'm going there for two minutes. So it's two minutes here. Three minutes here. Everything, everything is says. How many of you are sitting next to somebody like that? They're just, 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 just these administrators. But the blessing of these people is they come into organizations. And let me take from a church perspective. One of the biggest problems we have in churches, and particularly churches in our communities, is there's no question around the gifting and the anointing of the pastor. They're incredibly gifted and amazingly anointed people. But you know, the church is not only run by preaching. That, that's why I have that verse there in Acts chapter 6. It says, when the number of the disciples was, was expanding, then there was a dispute that started. Because when it came to food distribution, others were given food, others were not given food. See? And, and so there was a complaint that came. So even if there's a, the power of God moving, there are the administrative things that must go hand in hand. With the power of God moving. Yeah. So if, if, if you are running a church, uh, even if you may be anointed, if the administration is out of sorts, it can compromise what God wants to do. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it happens in our communities with people in business. Yeah. They have a business, they have a good model, great product, but administration, yay. You know, you get there, they have a board that says from nine o'clock, I know you are laughing out of revelation. At nine o'clock, get there, nine o'clock, there's nobody there. Mm -hmm. Nobody to explain what's going on. When they finally get there, if they do get there, at 10 o'clock, after you've waited for an hour, right? Do you want me to continue? Okay. But you see, there are people who, they are greatly gifted people, but very poor. When it comes to administration. That's why God gives us people with administration gifts. You see, I've seen people who, who have worked. Well, let me use the hair salon because we are all familiar with that. You have this guy who's really good at doing your hair, right? And then he de because he starts getting more clients, he decides to start his own. Yeah, there you go. He, start, he decides to start his own 
Yes, also he starts his branch, right? And then you all migrate with him because your hair is used to his hand. Or how do we say it? Your hair responds to his hand? <laughs> Whatever. And then you get with him and then it's total chaos. Because see, what he didn't realize is that the business didn't work because of talent only and gift only. That's what he's not figuring out. There's an admin side where you'll find he's, he's gifted in doing hair, but he's a poor administrator. Yeah. So you get to his business, everything's out of sorts. And you end up leaving the guy. See, So this gift of administration is important. Let me describe it a bit more as I close. So the gift of administration is a divine enablement to understand what makes an organization function and the special ability to plan and execute procedures that accomplish the goals of the ministry. Oftentimes you find in the ministry, in churches, we have goals or we call vision, but vision is never achieved. And it's not because people don't pray. <laughs> it's not because the anointing is not there, but because after you get vision, you've got to break it up into practical application. You have to go about the how to. How do we move from here to there? I know, you say, oh, God works in mysterious ways. I know, I know. <laughs> but even with Moses, here he is leading the children of Israel. God is working. He's the pastor of a church. He's got three million people. Moses, man of God, anointed, raised his rod, Red Sea opened, called manna from heaven, quails from the sky, greatly anointed. And the church has grown, three million people, but then he starts having problems. One day he's sitting over there and his father-in-law in Midian is watching this anointed man of God. The whole day he's sitting there counseling people. He's anointed. But his administration is dodgy. And the father-in-law comes and says, Muna, what are you doing? How are you sitting here alone by yourself judging the people the whole day? He says, if you keep, up, if you keep this up, you will wear out and the people will wear out. Then he gives him advice, says, choose from among you capable men. Let them be leaders of hundreds of thousands. And so that's administration. Yeah. yeah. So just the anointing is the administration. So this gift of admin, some of you, you are wired like that. When you look at something already in your mind, you can see this, if they can do this first and do this. And please may I ask you, if you are running a church, don't resist administrators helping you. Yes, yeah, sit down, talk to them, tell them the vision, let them explain. You can always modify, but don't say no. And some of you who are gifted, you know, I mean, you'll find, we know with our soccer stars, lots of these young guys, they make lots of money. Lots of money. Mara, they don't know how to administrate their money. And then when they pass on, we have to be collecting money for them. Because they abuse the money. See, when they were having a lot of money, you know, they were just spending Carelessly so, they didn't think about buying a house. You find a guy is driving a Lamborghini, but he's staying in a back room. I've never understood that. No, no, I didn't say you. So please don't, 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 don't be angry with me. I didn't say you. I, I was just saying somebody who's sitting next to you, not you. you know <laughs> Here's a guy, and lots of money. He's wearing, he's wearing designer clothes. Oh, yeah. From head to toe, when he comes, he says, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. How much am I? How much am I? How much am I? But then when he passes, we have to mobilize the community. Huh? And you wonder, he was earning millions. So the issue is not about the gift. Because none of us possesses all the gift. That's why we need one another. That's why the person next to you is just as important as you are. We need one another. Oh, come on, give the Lord a hand. We need one another. Yes. Let me close. I've gone over time a bit. What are the distinctives of these people? What distinguishes these people? Number one, they develop strategies or plans to reach identified goals. That's one thing they do. They know how to develop plans, strategies to reach the goal. Secondly, they assist organizations to be more effective. They assist. Thirdly, I like this one. They create order out of organizational chaos. You know the anointed people who are very chaotic, eh? 
<laughs> I tell you. <laughs> Jesus. Hey. Amazon, God is not a God of disorder. Please, let's not, let's not get away with chaos in the name of God, working in a mysterious way. The Spirit is moving. So, you know, Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like wind. You know, you know not where it bloweth, where it cometh from. I'm quoting the King James Bible. It sounds more anointed in the King James. Where it cometh from, where it's going. Now, come on, just get organized. Number four, they manage or coordinate a variety of responsibilities to accomplish the task. Five, they organize people, tasks, and events. And then they tend to assume responsibility if there's no structured leadership that exists. They just jump in because they see chaos. So you find they're trying to help. <laughs> what are the distinguishing features of these people, what we call traits? Number one, they are thorough. So these people who find calm. And I must be honest, Pastor, I... I like administration, but I don't enjoy administrating, okay? I don't think this is one of my gifts. I won't lie to you. I, and I didn't even say I'm chaotic either, so please don't go there. Okay, I think I'm organized to some extent. But uh, administrative people, they find comp, they're thorough. They, you know, they say, have you thought about this? Have you weighed the pros and the cons? Hey, have you done a feasibility study? Now, there's always a balance. Please, don't miss it. I just want to explain this. There's always a balance, okay? I'll balance it out at the end. But they're thorough. They're objective. You know, in other words, they, they are undistorted by emotion or personal opinion. They, it's about the task. And, and they, you know, yeah, they, you have to do this. So they're not going to be emotional or rather, you know, feel sorry for you because you are being, you know, there are some people who are disorganized, but when you try to organize them, bangala. I don't know how to say it in English. I'm sorry. I don't know how to say it in English, but... They sulk. Yeah, that's English. They sulk. Uh, yeah, no, no. Administrative people, they don't care if you sulk. They, they, because the organization has to be bigger than you. At the point. You see, there are, there are people who want to hold everybody hostage. There's a time when vision must be bigger than you. You can't sulk when the home cell is not growing. And you're losing more people in the cell group. And you, you've run out of steam. You're tired. You're no longer doing what you should be doing. So administrator comes and says, no, we move out. You say, you know how long I've been leading this cell? 52 years. You say, that's why you must move out. <laughs> Look at your neighbor who's not smiling and say, is it you who's doing that? Or what? <laughs> Administrative people that are responsible, they are organized, goal-oriented, and they're efficient. Now, here's the caution as, as I close with it. The only caution with... I want to give to people who are administrators is they need to be open to adjusting plans. Because sometimes administrative people can so tie you down that it stifles the vision. One of the things we've tried to maintain a delicate balance here at our church is that whilst we believe in being administrative, in being orderly, but we know there are things that can be spirit-led that were never there on our plans when we started. Or they were never allo we never allocated a budget for them. Because you know, administrative people, when you say, we, we must do this, they say, do you have a budget for it? <laughs> no, no, no. And, I, and I'm saying, you know, those are rare things where there's things that we never planned and so on. And I, and I think COVID has taught all of us that you can't, you can't dot every I and cross every T. Yeah, there's, there's a time when you need a bit of flexibility. And sometimes administrative people can be very inflexible. They may not understand sometimes God can tell you to do something that doesn't make sense from an administrative standpoint, but it comes from God. But, but you can't throw that in and say God all the time. Ah, we have to be sure it comes from God. The second thing is they can use people simply to accomplish goals without the concern for the people. You know, they can so want things to be done that they hurt people, they run over people, they don't help people to grow. And sometimes they give problems in the, in the process. And the last thing is that sometimes in meeting their goals, they can fail to see God's purposes. Because I think we must all admit, Baheso, there's a way, how do I say it? Even if we plan, we have vision, and I believe in that, we have goals and so on, there's a side to what we do where we, we don't know all there is to know. 
There are things that happen that are of God, and we, we never planned for it. We never factored it in. You know, it was never there. We never saw it, and it still works. And God's still there. So if you are too tight, you see, it becomes a problem. And this is one of the challenges that is there as churches grow and they become more structured. See, if you read church history, you'll find that the history of churches is as they start in the move of God. A lot of what they do, there's not much organization that's there. You know, it's God moving, people meeting. I mean, like the early church, people were getting healed, more people were coming, this and this, they were feeding people, there was no structure. And then the administrators came and said, hey, 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 hey. The apostles said, hey, we must have people who can feed these people, which was a good thing. But as you move forward, you find as the spirit moves, if you're not careful, administration can come in and stifle what God is doing. So as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very tricky balance. And this is where always in your organization, it's always worth it when there's a team of people who sit around the table to discuss these things. If you don't have a team, have other senior leaders that you can consult with. Tell them, look, this is what we're thinking. These are the pros and cons. What do you think? Give me advice. Because on the one hand, we must keep being structured, strong administratively, because you can, you can, you can, you know, business doesn't suggest effectiveness. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you can, you can be so busy and have a full calendar, but at the end, you, it's, you've moved so far away from your vision. But on the other hand, Vazalana, there are things that are spawned and birthed by the Holy Spirit that we need to be aware of. So you administrate that you are needed in organizations. And unfortunately, some people don't get to serve in that area. And then I say so much, my bishop works a lot in admin. She's even studied in line with that, you know. She got a degree in line with that. So she likes administration. And it's always interesting when we have discussions, particularly around things we don't agree with. It's very interesting and very explosive. <laughs> because I, I'm not much into admin. She's much into admin. And so we have to find a middle ground somewhere to say, okay, we can do this, but uh, please, this must be there. But it is that admin that keeps a church going. I, I couldn't imagine, Barcelona, where our church would be if it wasn't for administrators. I, 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 I can't imagine. I'm being honest with you. I can't imagine. I, I just can't imagine. I mean, when you come in here, you see all things being done. The ushers are there. Counselors are there. There's people on the cameras. There's people kai kai. And there's a lot of these people who are working behind the scenes. You may never know their name. You may never know their name. And, they, and like I said, when they work in their department, there's nobody falling out under the power of God. <laughs> there's nobody. That's us. There's no choir, there's no music, it's all quiet. It seems unspiritual. That's the point I'm trying to drive to. But it's, it's as spiritual as they come. Because if it was not for that, yeah. Listen, listen as I close. Listen what, 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 what uh, Jethro says to Moses. He says, if you don't administrate, you will wear out. And the people will wear out. He has a great anointed man of God who comes to a point where he chokes in ministry and he chokes the anointing because he's not having administration. So there's a coexistence of this gift in a delicate balance. And I pray some of you who are running businesses and I want to really speak in our communities. There's lots of people who are really gifted, great business models, but terrible administration. Very, very bad. Very, very bad. I mean, I've been flying in and out of OR Tambo the last few weeks and on every trip I've, we've landed, we've had to wait in the plane for 15 to 30 minutes. Yeah, because the ground staff there, I don't know what's the story with them. Yeah. And you get that. So even if you've made up good time flying and you are thankful that, hey, at least we're early. Mara, all that earliness, I know that's not good English, all that earliness is going to be wiped away by some administrator who's not functional. Because there's some guy on the ground who's supposed to be doing administration who is as disorganized as they come. They don't know how to plan. They don't know how to anticipate. And I'm standing there thinking, I've traveled many parts of the world. This, is not, this doesn't happen. I come home and I'm reminded, welcome back. <laughs> and if there's one thing I think we must really, really do our best to lift up is the administration part, Bazalana. We'll go a long way. Give the Lord a big hand. Give the Lord a big hand of praise.
Come on, you are gifted by God. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. Oh, I see you imagine. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. Shall we all stand on our feet? I'd like us to pray for one another as we conclude this service. Would you hold the person next to you and I? I want to do it the way Dr. Miles Monroe used to do it. I love it. I love it. You know that verse that says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's very interesting when you read it in the New Living Translation. It says that we are unique people. We are unique people. Distinct people. Because of God's hand upon your life. So hold the hand of that person and just squeeze it a bit. That's a, that's a unique person that you're holding. Now don't break it. Just squeeze it. Okay, just squeeze it a little more gently. You're holding the hand of someone that God took the time to make them. Create them. That, that person has a special place in the world. They, they may not... They may not be fulfilling it. But I believe as they listen to the Holy Spirit speak to them, they're going to rise. There's a work that's incomplete that's waiting for that person. Just squeeze the hand, that unique person that you're holding their hand. So this is what I want to ask you. I want to ask you with all the love and the compassion in your heart, you pray for them. Maybe they haven't discovered it. If they have discovered it, that they will more and more fulfill what God has called them to do. Will you just pray for them? Just pray for them right now.